If you're familiar with Greek mythology and literature, then you've probably heard of the Lycians. They appear in Homer's Iliad, where they're led by the hero Sarpedon and his cousin Glaucus. They fought for the Trojans during the Trojan War, and their kingdom, known as Lycia, was along the Xanthus River. Lycia was said to have been a scenic place filled with orchards. Homer though wrote in the 8th century BCE, some 500 years after the Trojan War. At that time, probably around 1200 BCE, the land known as Lycia went by another name, Luca, whose people spoke Luvian, a language that was predominant throughout much of Western Anatolia at the time. Most scholars believe that these people, the Luca, were the late Bronze Age ancestors of the Lycians. The Luca appear in both Hittite and Egyptian texts. To the Hittites, they were one of their many subject peoples, though not always the most loyal. In Egyptian texts, they're named as one of the groups of maritime marauders known as the Sea Peoples. Lycia also appears in Greek mythology as the setting for some of the adventures of the Greek hero Bellerophon. There are actually plenty of other tales that deal with Lycia and the Lycians. Even the name comes from myth. One tradition states that it was named after the goddess Leto in honor of the wolves, which in Greek are called Lakoi, who helped to protect her and her infant children, Artemis and Apollo. Though I'd love to continue talking more about Lycia in Greek mythology, let's get into some actual history of the kingdom. There's little historical information with regard to the kingdom of Lycia until the middle of the 6th century BCE. Herodotus tells us that the Lycians, along with the Cilicians further east, were the only people not conquered by the Lydian king Croesus during his campaigns in Asia Minor. However, around 540 BCE, Croesus was defeated by Cyrus the Great of Persia, and soon the Persian king's loyal commander, Harpagus, campaigned against the other cities in southwestern Asia Minor. In most places, he met with little resistance, that is, until he reached Lycia, where on the plains just outside the capital city of Xanthus, he was confronted by a band of fierce Lycian warriors. Herodotus describes what happened next. When Harpagos led his army onto the plain of Xanthos, the Lycians attacked him suddenly and fought, a few against many, and with great valor. They were defeated, however, and forced to retire inside their walls. Once trapped in their city, they gathered together their women, children, possessions, and servants of the Acropolis, and set fire to it, burning up everything. Then, having sworn powerful oaths, the men of Xanthos went forth again to do battle against Harpagos. They all died fighting. And so, the present-day Lycians, who claim to be Xanthians, are mostly immigrants, with the exception of 80 families, whose ancestors at the time of the battle happened to be abroad and thus survived. That is how Harpagos took Xanthos. Though Xanthos was later rebuilt and repopulated, it was firmly under Persian control. It was probably also during this time that Lycia's powerful ruling dynasty emerged, which had its seat at Xanthos. Of course, it owned its rise to Persian support, but locally it was quite powerful and had a great deal of autonomy in running Lycian affairs, that is, so long as it was still loyal to the Persian king. This arrangement worked for over a century until Lycia allied with Athens as a member of the Delian League, probably at the instigation of the Athenian commander, Cimon, during his campaigns in southern Asia Minor in the 460s BCE. However, once Cimon and the rebellion that he inspired were crushed, all ties with Athens were disbanded, and Lycia returned back to the orbit of the Persian crown. In the 4th century BCE, Sources indicate that there was some unrest in Lycia followed by the disappearance, at least politically, of the Xanthian dynasty. This may have been due to the rise of Pericles. This is a different Pericles than the famous Athenian general and statesman. This particular Pericles of Asia Minor 
organized, or at least took a leading role in what's been called the Great Satraps Revolt from 366 to 360 BCE, which was a massive rebellion of several satraps, or provinces, against Achaemenid rule, specifically of Artaxerxes II. Pericles defeated the Achaemenid satrap or governor, Artumpara, and eventually established himself as the king of Lycia. However, within a decade, his rebellion was crushed, and the Achaemenids retook Lycia and the surrounding area. Lycia was then put under the authority of Masulis, the satrap of neighboring Caria. It remained under Achaemenid rule until 334 or 333 BCE, when Alexander the Great conquered the region. Upon Alexander's death in 323 BCE, Lycia came first under the control of Antigonus of Macedon, and was then followed by Ptolemaic and then Seleucid rule. However, with the defeat of the Seleucid king, Antiochus III, by a Roman army in 190 BCE, Lycia became a Roman possession. In the year 43, the emperor Claudius formed the Roman province of Lycia. Along with having their own distinctive style of art, the Lycians are most famous for their coins, which were some of the most beautiful of any that have ever been found from the 5th to 3rd centuries BCE. Many have said that while the neighboring Lydians may have invented coinage, the Lycians perfected it. The Lycians also had their own language, of which about 180 inscriptions utilizing it have been found. Most of these inscriptions appear on various tombs that were carved into cliffs, though some have also appeared on ruined monuments and coins. Unfortunately, much of the Lycian language hasn't been deciphered, though it's clear to scholars that it's related to Bronze Age Luvian. Even Lycian religion, before it was infused with the Greek pantheon, had its own deities that were reminiscent of Luvian religion. For example, the Lycian storm god, Tarkas, was very similar to the Luvian Hittite deity, Tarhundas or Teshub. The most popular Greek deities worshipped by the Lycians were Leto, Apollo, and Artemis. So I hope that you've enjoyed this program on the history of Lycia and the Lycians. Thanks to all of you for stopping by, I really appreciate it. If you learned something, or simply just enjoyed the video, please don't hesitate to hit that like button because it helps the channel out a lot. Also, check out the History with Sai podcast where I go into more detail with regard to some of the topics discussed on the channel. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thanks again, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Take care, and stay safe.